you haven't already. Uh, today's talk is about building an AppSec program with zero budget. I love it, and going beyond you know, OWASP top 10. Chris Romeo is the CEO and a co-founder of Security Journey, and they have a lot of educational materials uh, on their website. Uh, he um, sp specializes in online application security training organized as a security belt program. Um, he, is, he will love you to connect with him on LinkedIn and follow him and you know, be involved in the podcast and stuff. And without further ado, Chris. All right, thanks, Tim. So, um, yeah, just a couple other things here about me. Um, I do, uh, I'm the co-host of the Application Security Podcast. Um, I've been hanging out in the members' lounge yesterday, interviewing lots of interesting people. So um, if you want to kind of hear about some of the people that were at the conference, maybe you didn't get to hear their sessions. I'm also part of the OWASP Triangle Chapter. That's back in Raleigh, North Carolina, which is my home. And I'm definitely glad to be here today, even though I'm far from home. Glad to always be at an OWASP event. Always guaranteed to be a rule, an unruly crowd or, you know, lots of, uh, lots of fun along the way. So here's what I want to talk about with you today um, from this idea of building an application security program. So very quickly, I'm going to talk about the traditional AppSec programs and security community. And then I'll get into my thoughts and ideas about how you can actually build an AppSec program using just the things that you have in the OWASP universe. So when I say OWASP universe, that just means everything you can find on the OWASP webpage. And uh, so we'll, we'll talk about some of the different categories there. So if we think about traditional AppSec programs, we kind of have to, we have to just quickly discuss what that means to understand how we're going to fit the various OWASP pieces into the, this kind of a mold. And so if you think about kind of traditional definitions, people process tools, on the people side, you've got everybody that you're trying to get in your organization that's going to be doing things for security. You've got your developers, your testers, your program managers, your product managers, people managers, executives. On the process side, you may or may not have a secure development lifecycle that's at the core that drives your program. Um, you may have uh, product security incident response, bug bounty. All of these are process-related pieces that we need to have. Then on the tools side, we've got SAS, DAST, IAS, RASP, all of these different types of tools and technologies. Uh, vulnerability scanning, we've got dependency checking. So all, all of these are the traditional pieces. If you go into any big organization and, and you take a look at their application security program, these are the pieces that you're going to find for those that have a lot of money to spend. And so I think it just helps to, to set that framework before we talk about what we can do on uh, kind of from the OWASP universe. And so... Regardless of how much money you have to spend, I think you have a common set of goals for an application security program. I think at first it starts with just limiting vulnerabilities in deployed code. That's really what we all want to do, regardless of how much money we have to spend in the process. Uh, we want to be able to build secure software and teach developers how to code securely. That's always going to be a goal of ours. We want the processes. We want maturity. Um, but it really comes down to how do we limit those vulnerabilities in, in the code that's being created. And so... I, can't, I created this, this talk and this idea after I thought this question must have been answered before. I thought somebody must have answered, how can you take all the pieces from the world of OWASP and put them together into a program? I looked and I looked and it wasn't there. And so I said, you know what? I'm going to take that as a challenge and I'm going to try to to look in, at everything in the OWASP universe and figure out how I can filter it and put it into different sections to actually make something that could become a program. And so... Um, and just remember, I mean, everybody in this room, you're here, you love OWASP already, so you know just because it's free doesn't mean it doesn't have a lot of value. So just because we're talking about something that might be free, OWASP stuff is still going to be some of the best stuff, uh, better than th some of the things that you could actually spend money on. And so I'm also a realist, and I know that not everybody's going to be coming at this problem with a budget of exactly zero. I know some people are going to have large budgets, some people are going to have small budgets. The... The advantage of approaching this through the kind of lens of the world of OWASP is even if you have budget, there's still a lot of cool things in OWASP that you can use to make your program better. Maybe save a little bit of money, but it doesn't necessarily mean this is only for those with, with no money. But if you have a small budget, you can really plug in some things into your program that'll make it, make it a lot better. And so um, I, gotta, I just got to mention security champions because... Security champions is this idea of, of gathering people who are passionate about security, getting them engaged, getting them to, uh, to, to be your eyes and ears on the ground. So say you have five 
Um, so you have two application security programs, uh, two people in your program, and you have a thousand developers. Security champions is how you magnify your voice and magnify what you can actually do by engaging other people. And so I mentioned this up front because all the other sections I'm going to talk about are going to be dependent on security champions to be successful. You have to have this uh, boots on the ground type of group who can help you in, in all the different areas that we're going to talk about here. So I, I came to this in, in the, the way I approached this is I started with the OWASP project inventory. And so if you know, in the OWASP project inventory, they, they tag projects as various different classifications, whether it's flagship, lab projects, or incubators based on how mature an individual project is. And so I kind of started at the top with the flagship projects, and then I made my way down through until I got to incubator. And as you know, and if you have a project in an incubator or you've used any of them, they're not necessarily production ready. They're sometimes alpha, beta, maybe something somewhere in between. But that's okay. I still gave them my consideration when I was trying to figure out what we could use. So then I also built this, what I'll call my scale of project risk here. If we're going to take, if we're going to use open source projects and things and, and embed them into a program, we at least have to be thinking about what is the risk or potential for this project to just go away. Because if we're going to, if we're going to bet our whole program on a two or three projects, we at least have to be thinking about is this something that's so new that it may not have an, ever have another release or it may, uh, this may, this may be something that, um, you know, I've got a lot of risk. From. So I rated these um, from 0 to 10, 0 being, you know, this project's not going anywhere. If it goes away, OWASP is going to be gone, and then none of this other stuff will matter. And then all the way through, you know, stable to newer projects to older projects that haven't been updated in a long time to 10, which if I added one of those, then you should wonder why I even added that to the project. So just remember that there is no guarantee that your, any project that you use here is going to exist. It's just, that's just the OWASP way. I mean, we can feel pretty good about some of the projects that have been around for 10 years and stuff, but it's just, it's no guarantee. So I broke these projects into three primary categories here. That, so if we're going to build a program, we're going to have to start thinking about some smaller pieces for how we, how we chunk these things together. And so the categories themselves are awareness and knowledge, and then process and measurement, and then tools. So the first one is awareness, what I'll call awareness, knowledge, and education. Okay, there's, um, with, with this particular grouping, there's probably not a lot of surprises here if you've been around the OWASP universe. But what I found when I started doing this research and looking at all these different projects is there's so much stuff out there in OWASP that I was finding things I had never heard of. I had never heard of the automated threat handbook before I started digging into this. I just, I guess I never had a need for it. I never started, I never looked for it. But when I was going through the list looking, I was like, wow, this is really cool. This is a very mature document. And so you will find things along the way. So let's, let's look at each of these real quick and kind of break down what I see as the risk. So, you know, the OWASP top 10, it's, everybody knows this well. I'm not going to spend much time on it. I mean, I think it's got a risk of zero because this is the flagship product of the entire, um, the entire OWASP world. Uh, it's, it's, I think of this as an awareness document, though. I, I think so many people, and I don't, it's probably not the people in this room, but a lot of people who are looking at making requirements for when they buy things, say they use the OWASP top 10 as a requirements document and a requirements spec. And, and for me, it's an awareness document. I want my developers to, to understand each and every one of these things and to know what each of those attacks actually means and how they work. But it's not a set of requirements. But very, uh, very low risk from my perspective of, of including OWASP top 10, as you would imagine. OK, proactive controls. How many people were aware of proactive controls? Raise a hand real quick. OK. All right, so about half the room. I was the same way. I didn't, I didn't know about this uh, until um, I actually got, a ch I got invited and had a chance to contribute on the 3.0, the latest version of this that came out. And that's when I really dug into it. This is, this is a set of controls for developers that is designed to be a, kind of an inverse to the OWASP top 10. This is what you want developers to do to prevent the, the OWASP top 10 from ever occurring in your web applications. I mean, look, you've got secure database access. That is your SQL injection counter. Um, you've got encoding and escaping data. That's your cross-site scripting um, balance, thing that balances cross-site scripting out. And so proactive controls, um, it's, it's uh, once again, an awareness document. I gave it a risk of two. Um, that's pretty low on the scale. I think this is going to exist for a long time as well. Automated threat handbook. With this, with this document, 
I don't really want developers to memorize this. Like, I want developers to be able to recite this, the, these 10 things from the proactive controls in their sleep. That's how much I want them to know this. Something like the threat handbook, this is more of, I, I just want them to know it exists. I don't need them to be able to explain to me what is a credential stuffing attack. Well, I mean, it would be nice if they could, but I don't need everybody to be able to do that. If I can just get them to know there is this document called Automated Threat Handbook, and it's a reference, so if they're thinking of, if they're, they encounter something that they think is an automated threat, they can go to this document, look it up, and read the descriptions that are in there, I'll consider that a win. Um, I gave that a three just because that's a little bit of a newer project than um, some of the other ones. Okay, OWASP cheat, cheat sheets. This is the short and sweet version that developers love on how to do almost anything you can think of in the world of application security. So, I mean, take a look at some of the things you see on this list. Access control, logging, um, password storage, SQL injection prevention, transport layer protection. The beautiful thing about the cheat sheets is they are short and sweet and they're to the point so that developers, when they go to read them, there's not a lot of fluff. Because a lot of people in this room are developers. I know you don't want to go read five pages before you get to the good stuff that actually tells you how to answer the question that you had. You want the short and sweet version. Um, the team that, that works on the cheat sheets has done a great job. There's been, you know, I don't know, hundreds of authors that have contributed these cheat sheets, some companies that have thrown their stuff in. So once again, a very good reference type of resource. Um, I, wanna, I want, in, in our program, I want our developers to know that this exists, again, and know that, have an index to what's available here so they can go search it out. Um, see, uh, security knowledge framework, okay? This is a OWASP project that it, it uses the uh, ASVS, the, app, the application security verification standard, the, the requirements. It uses that, and then it also provides code samples for how to meet the security requirements of ASVS in each of these languages correctly. So this is a, this is a, a tool that I want developers to just have the ability to reference. I want this running as part of our program so that the developers can go to this. They can say, okay, I'm dealing with a particular type of issue. Um, and then they can say, I want to use Java or whatever. And then they can look at a particular piece of code like cross-site scripting filtering. There's a, a Java-specific example for that. So I want them to be able to look at those, those, those um, pieces of code and kind of see where we're at. Hands-on training. So OWASP has a lot of great stuff in the hands-on training perspective. What I mean by this is these are vulnerable web applications. Uh, that developers can go and they can actually try to break stuff. This is a great way for developers to learn about the OWASP top 10 and even the proactive controls is to go through and break stuff along the way. And so there's three things I'm highlighting that I recommend for, from a programmatic perspective on the hands-on training perspective. WebGoat has been around almost as long as OWASP, maybe longer, I can't remember, but uh, it's, a, um, it's an OWASP top 10 uh, vulnerable application written in Java, and uh, it's, it's quite good. Um, DevSlop is a relatively new project where the team is putting together microservices in a DevOps environment that are vulnerable, so trying to help people expose some of the other security issues that can exist in the microservices world. And then JuShop, uh, out of these three, JuShop has the most... Um, it's the most set up for like a capture the flag type of an environment, and it has the most types of different types of attacks and things that uh, you, you can find there. So um, part of this is, from this awareness perspective, is let's get our developers to actually put their hands on keyboards and start doing some stuff here. Um, risks of these, I say, is three. So it's, uh, everything you've seen so far has been relatively low risk to include into a program from my perspective. So as I was doing this analysis, I thought, OK, what's missing? from these? What are the pieces that you're going to have to figure out on your own that I can't give you an OWASP piece to actually do? And so the missing pieces in this section are how are you going to deliver that? You got to figure out how to deliver the proactive controls, the top 10, the automated threat framework, the, the hands-on tools. How are you going to deliver those back to your user base? That's something you'll have to figure out. How are you going to administer you know, the juice shop platforms? Um, somebody's going to have to be assigned to kind of do that. So here's where I think you, here's where I think the impact is, and ultimately for each of these sections, I'll give you what I think the headcount requirement is to really do this correctly, because even though we have a budget of zero, we're still gonna need some people to help bring this together, because if you don't have a couple of people driving this, then good luck with, with trying to get any type of um, real impact. 
So I think on the, on the awareness side with the top 10 the proactive controls, it's really just about let's get some foundational understanding of these concepts to every developer in the organization. On the knowledge side, we got those secure coding examples, which are huge. And then with the hands-on training, I mean, I can tell you it's just there's something about when you take developers who have not done a lot with security and you put them in front of the keyboard and let them actually try different types of attacks and things, it just it changes the way they view their own applications in the future. And so there's a, a huge impact to be found there. Okay, how can you, what, what, are, what are some real quick ways you can start with these? Uh, so on the awareness side, you can just, you, lunch and learns are a great way to approach this. Do a lunch and learn for the OWASP top 10. Do it for the OWASP top one. Focus on injection as one, one particular lunch and learn. Um, on the knowledge side, it's more about, like I said, it's more about awareness of the cheat sheets, having the cheat sheets available maybe internally, doing a training session on one of the cheat sheets just to show developers how to actually use them. On the hands-on training side, you're going to have to build out some of these. And like Juice Shop makes it very easy. You can actually, they have a deploy to Heroku button. So you can actually, with one button click, you can deploy your own Juice Shop instance, and then you can point your developers to that in the cloud if you really want to be able to get something like Juice Shop going quickly. Um, and then hackathons are a great way to approach using Juice Shop. I did that with our OWASP chapter in Raleigh, North Carolina. We set up uh, a number of Juice Shop instances in the cloud, had a, had a bunch of developers. We did it over lunch, so it wasn't like the traditional evening meetup. Had a bunch of developers and, that had never done anything with AppSec before, invited them into the room, had about five or six security people and maybe 20 or 30 developers with no security background. And it's fun to watch developers start tearing into Juice Shop. When you got people that really know how to code and they start trying to break something, like they're, they, were, they, they just really got into it. So that's, that's a great way to approach that one. So that's, that's kind of the awareness and training side. Let's talk about process and measurement. So some of the process pieces that we can bring in here. Uh, so first we have in the OWASP universe, you have SAM, the Software Assurance Maturity Model. What SAM does is it gives you a catalog and a way to measure where your program is right now. And so the importance of SAM when you're trying to build this program for zero dollars or, or um, with, without any type of cost is SAM really gives you a couple things. It gives you a way to, to, to measure where are we today with our overall approach to the program. It also gives you a whole bunch of things to look forward to in the future. You can, you can reverse engineer SAM to say, where can we go with our program? Because SAM has different levels for each of these things, like, um, let's say, threat assessment. Um, they have different levels of, of maturity. And so if you measure yourself at threat assessment as your, your program with a level one, you can look at level two and say, OK, what should I be aiming for? What should I be? So this can actually help you to guide your program and build a strategy for how you, how you move things in the future. SAM has been around forever, so there's almost no risk to that. ASVS is the set of requirements that OWASP, the document that OWASP puts out with requirements. They're broken into each of these categories, focused on web apps specifically um, across all these different, um, different types of categories. Uh, ASVS is broken down also into individual levels as far as how um, so the requirements are tiered based on how, um, how, how you know, what is, the, what is the, the kind of threat landscape look like for your individual application? You can tier ASVS to meet that. The point with this is a lot of organizations try to build their own set of requirements, and they take inputs from other places. But if you don't have an existing set of requirements now, ASVS gives you a nice place to start with um, that requirement base. OK, so threat modeling on the process side. I'm a huge proponent of threat modeling, of teaching developers how to analyze the security of the features that they're working on and, and dis discover any of the types of problems they can find before things get too far down the, down the line. And so there's a project, OS project application threat modeling. Um, I put the risk, you'll notice, pretty high on this one. There's, there's a lot of change that's happening with this project right now. There's some, a lot of new people that are bringing different ideas, and they're trying to organize their messaging and everything along the way. So, um, so still very worthy, but uh, just there's, there's some kind of changes and things going on there. Okay, if we're going to do process, we're going we're gonna to have to talk about code review. We need to be able to give our developers a standard to help them follow through in the code review process, and that's what this OWASP document does. It provides the process for you, and then it gives your developers all the different types of things that they need to be looking at as they're going through and looking at their own code. It's even got you know, review checklists and, 
and uh, just a lot of really great stuff there about how to do the code review um, along the way. And then you've got the OWASP testing guide. The, of all the documents I've seen in the OWASP universe, the testing guide really does a great job of, ex of explaining concepts and how to do things. Like if you go look at the cross-site scripting section of the OWASP testing guide, they spend like three pages on how to test for various cross-site scripting scenarios, and they really give a, a, a very detailed description with screenshots and things. And so this document becomes your, your process and your knowledge base for how do you want people to test in this new program. So what are we missing here in the process side? So we're missing that overall end-to-end -end secure development lifecycle or secure SDLC. There is, at this stage, for some reason, and I don't know why, there is no OWASP secure development lifecycle project. Nobody has actually said, okay, let's try and build an open version of the process for Agile for DevOps is, is how you build security in and, and how, do you, how you shift things left. So you're not going to be able to pull that from, the, from, the, from an OWASP project, but you can put together a number of the things I'm talking about here into an SDL if you're starting from scratch. Uh, one of the other things that's missing here is the program metrics. So you're going to have to design your own way to determine how well you're doing in this process, um, whether that's measuring uh, time to fix bugs <laughs> that have been identified as security bugs over time. Um, that's a great metric to use to do that, but there's really not a metrics project that helps us along that way. Um, yeah, and then deployment advice. So, so, here is, so here's the impact from both the process and measurement, and, and I really envision you're going to need one and a half people to be focused to do this well. And when I say one and a half people for like process and measurement, I'm thinking about you know, a decent sized organization with 1,000 developers. So if you scale yourself down and say you're 100 developers, you, know, you can scale this. This isn't going to be as big of a, of a kind of commitment from headcount as far as what you need to be successful. So on the process side, I mean, ASVS is all about the requirements. That's your requirements base if you don't have anything moving forward. Uh, the app threat modeling is you've got the process there. They've got some good examples on that wiki page. And, so that's, that's a, a good one to work from. Um, the code review, the testing guide, these are your process for how you do those things. These are your instructions to teach people how to do it as well. And then on the measurement side, um, you know, we really need that roadmap. We need, we need that SAM roadmap for where we are today and where we want to get to in the future. And that's what the SAM project does for us. So how do we get started with these two? How do we be successful? Um, so on the process side, you can't, I, don't, I don't, really don't think you can do all of these things at the same time. I don't think you can implement code review, testing, requirements, threat modeling. You try to do all, even two out of those four at the same time, and it's going to be very, very difficult. So my recommendation is when you're trying to get started in, in doing this, pick one thing out of that list and focus on that in your first six months or one year. I like to go to threat modeling because I think that has the highest rate of return for the amount of effort that you put into actually embedding it into your program and into your organization. Um, but don't try to boil the ocean. Don't try to do everything at the same time. Break it down and, and do one thing at a time. Um, on the measurement side, I mentioned doing that early assessment, um, creating the future plan, sharing. Share these assessments with anybody that will listen. Your champions group, they should be aware of where we are, where we want to go. Um, executives, if you've got executives that will listen, please tell them all about this stuff. Um, and ask them to, to kind of help you along the way. But one of the things executives are going to want to see here and what SAM does for you is they're going to want to see where are we today? If, if we move forward with your plan, where do you think we can get to? And the nice thing about that is SAM gives you those pieces. It, it, it'll help you in framing that strategy so you don't have to create it from scratch and just try to, try to create something. You can use the pieces of SAM to make that argument for you. Okay, last category here that I have is the tools section. So a couple of different tools that, and, and this I would say is the most disjointed category that I have because these things, as you're looking at this list, they kind of all fit into different places in the, in the development lifecycle. Um, OWASP Threat Dragon. So I put this one in here, and uh, this is a relatively new project at OWASP, and uh, it is the, it's, it's a web app that allows you to do threat modeling 
right in the browser and store your, um, store your threat models in GitHub. Uh, this one, I, I, this, I put this as a risk of five. This is still an alpha status right now. Uh, but I'm, I'm such a proponent. I, I love threat modeling so much. I really want to see this be successful as a project because I think it has a lot of value in that it helps you to capture the process. So you can just point a developer to this and say, OK, draw a picture of the feature that you're working from. And then the tool will help you to make your way through at least the initial threats. And so I think that the, this tool is a great learning thing for developers. Um, because I think of threat modeling really as more of something that I want developers to know and to just understand over time. And so um, with Threat Dragon, that's a good way to kind of start and help them get there. We can't have an OWASP application security program without CRS, the core rule set with mod security boiled into it. Um, it's just such a mature project here. And what this allows you to do is this becomes your web application firewall sitting in front of your applications. Um, like I said, this is, this is a category where there's a lot of things kind of thrown in together, but um, you know, core, the core rule set on, with mod security is going to help you to block the OWASP top 10 style attacks that are coming inbound into your applications. Um, this is more of an infrastructure play than any type of thing that, that's going to directly influence your developers. I mean, you're going to have, this is going to get built into your infrastructure and then it's going to be a part of that into the future. Okay, then we've got dependency check. Um, who uses dependency check right now? Okay, awesome. I love to see that's more than half. Okay, dependency check, very simple. It solves a very simple problem, but this is a very mature product that solves that problem. What it does is it allows, it, it checks to see do you have any known vulnerabilities in the third party software that you are using in your, in your applications. Commercial versions of solving this problem cost tens, if not hundreds of thousands of dollars. And this is an OWASP project that is pretty close to feature. <laughs> They're pretty close in their feature parity with what you can spend a lot of money on here. And so I love this project, because, and also because it's so easy to put in. You can install, you can add dependency check to your build pipeline in about 30 seconds to a minute. It's, it's very simple to add in. No, I mean, it might break. Now, if it breaks a bunch of stuff, if you've got a bunch of old software, that's on you, OK? But the 30 seconds part is just to add the tool in to the process. Okay? It'll tell you if you've got those problems. It'll kick it out to report. It, it uses lots of different languages. It's got plugins for all your different build pipeline type of stuff you're doing. Um, great project. They just added a new piece to this I don't even have on here. It's called Dependency Tracker, which gives you more of the enterprise management side to it. So that makes it even more awesome. Yes, sir? And the input source, MDB, what is that? Uh, National Vulnerability Database. Oh. So this is the US um, government's standard source for CVEs that get recorded. And so dependency check ingests those automatically for you. So you don't even have to update it as far. You, can, you don't have to tell it about vulnerabilities. It gets it all from there, the feed there. So um, OK, then we've got Zap. Everybody knows Zap. If you've been in the OWASP world for more than five minutes, you've heard somebody tell you about Zap. You've been to a meetup to talk about it. Zap is your um, proxy-based testing tool. Um, some would say it is similar to a dynamic application security testing tool. Some would say it's not. Some would argue with me to the death about that. But, um, but yeah, it's a great tool. It's very mature. It's been around for a long time. It allows, it, 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 in conjunction with the OWASP testing guide, this is a, it's a tool your testers are going to need in your program to be successful as they make their way through the testing guide. OK, so what's missing here in the tools perspective in the OWASP universe? So first of all, you'll notice, I, and maybe somebody knows about something I don't, but I don't see any, op, uh, any real OWASP pieces for static application security testing or you know, static analysis. Now, I know there are a few different uh, open source tools that, people, that I've heard about that people use uh, for Python and Ruby and some of the other languages, um, Java, find, I think find bugs or something. So you may be able to plug something else in here. My point was there really isn't anything from the OWASP world that, that I can slot in here. Uh, and then so the other thing that I think we're missing is there's really no dashboard. Um, and, and I may, after, I learned about something called Defect Dojo yesterday. Does anybody, anybody from, know, def, use Defect Dojo? Okay. So... Um, I think, and this just tells you how big the OWASP universe is, I thought I looked at everything to do this, and I think Defect Dojo slipped past me, and I think Defect Dojo would actually do this piece that I say is missing. So i got to add a slide here. I'll do it later, though. Um, so yeah, so I think that'll give you that dashboard. So I actually don't think that's missing. I think Defect Dojo solves that problem for us. So um, 
So your impact, so on the design side, Threat Dragon just helps you to, to make the process a reality. Um, on the infrastructure side, CRS gives you that WAF, dependency checks looking at your third party stuff. Zap's gonna do something similar to your DAST and plugins, plugins to various other things. So how do you use this? How do you get started with it? So um, I think taking Threat Dragon and including that, making and pointing your development teams to it, it at least in a pilot mode, is a way to get them, get them start thinking about threat modeling. The challenge here is it is still alpha right now, so it's a little bit, it's, 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 I can't even say it's a little bit, it's not feature complete anywhere near, but it does actually work and it, it can actually be used. On the infrastructure side, I mean, add dependency check to your build pipeline tomorrow. I mean, that's, that's how, how serious I think and how easy I think it is to get the value that comes out of that. Um, get Zap to the testers, you know, get mod security with CRS into the infrastructure that you have. I think those are all, those are all doable pieces that um, you know, shouldn't, be, shouldn't be huge. So if we total up kind of all the headcount summary that I think we need to be successful here, I mean, you're at basically four and a half people to really do all of these things at the same time and really roll it out fast. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean that's the best way to even approach this problem, though. I would say you can, you can work with whatever the headcount, whatever you have as far as resources that can be dedicated to doing this. You can focus them. You're just not going to be able to do everything at the same time. You're going to have to say, okay, let's start with something on the awareness side. Let's just get OWASP top 10 out there, proactive controls, pick something. Um, we can do a hands-on training. Um, we can introduce some of the knowledge tools, some of the process stuff with uh, the ASVS and the requirement side. So pick a small piece. Don't necessarily try to do all this stuff at the same time. So here's, the, here's all of everything I've talked about today in one slide. I probably should have started here. I could have started with this slide, talked for five minutes, and then dismissed the class maybe. Um, but just so you can see when it all comes together, and you notice I've got security champions and security community here riding on this side because that is such an important piece of kind of what we're doing here is the security community side of it. Um, all of these different pieces, they all fit together. There's probably even more stuff that I could put into this, but, um, and, and when we get to Q&A, you can tell me what I missed, because I had, that, I actually got the security knowledge framework. I didn't have this originally, and I did this talk for our local uh, OWASP chapter as a warm up, and, and somebody raises their hand and said, what about security knowledge framework? And I said, what's that? And then he explained it to me, I'm like, oh, I gotta put that in. Um, if you think about this from the SDL perspective, I'm a big secure development lifecycle person, so if you think about it, so I thought I would just give you the same information from the previous slide if you want to think about this from the SDL perspective. So same, these are all the same tools I talked about already. I just put them into the nice categories of a high-level Microsoft-like SDL. Um, is this a DevOps SDL? No, this is, <laughs> this is higher, a little higher level. If we want to talk about how that fits in the DevOps world, we've got to go a little bit deeper. So uh, here, here's my final thoughts, and then we'll do some questions and answers. Um, so, I mean, OpenSAM, I can't say it enough, that, that's the tool that allows you to really plan where you are and where you're going. I've already said a number of times there's no secure development lifecycle here in OWASP, but all, as you saw, the component pieces are all here. It's just we don't have it in a document where it all fits together nicely. Uh, we want to start small, um, pick one of those things, start with the top 10, start with proactive controls, you know, start with one of those pieces and use that as the way to launch. Security community and champions, you can't do this without somebody helping you if you're going to do it with a very small budget. You're going to have to have some group of people. And just to, to, to you know, kind of hit on that one more time, you'll find there are developers in your organization now that are passionate about security. And if you don't know who they are, you just got to find them. Okay? I, I promise you, it doesn't matter how big. I'm not telling you you're going to find 100 people. If you only have 150 developers, you might get lucky, but there's at least a few, and they're willing to help you do all of these things. You just have to tap into them. You just have to, you have to engage them. Uh, you know, figure out where you want to go from a one to two year plan if you don't have all the resources up front. And just remember, you know, while OWASP is free, all the components, all the projects and things are free, there is still some amount of headcount required to bring all these things together and, and build out this program. So. Um, with that, I left us nine minutes, I think, to 
for questions and answers, and also share with me the things I've missed in this. I'd love to add more stuff to this. Yes, sir, we'll start here. Oh, yeah, he's going to, yeah, he'll bring you the microphone to ask your question. This is super eye-opening. Thank you. I've never actually even viewed OWASP this way. And um, in my mind, I'm starting to think of some of the gaps, and I think they're operational gaps. I don't know if OWASP identifies that way, but what I see missing is, uh, like, uh, bug bounty ingestion, mm -hmm. incident response support, like uh, how, to, how to keep records and coordinate uh, incidents. And uh, uh, the other one would be like uh, ingestion of uh, vulnerability information like from customer reports of vulnerabilities. Yeah. And I guess these are probably built into tech support systems, but it's all like in the Yeah, no, and I think, I think you got a couple of good things you're mentioning there. So um, I haven't seen yet anything. I really haven't seen bug bounty come up in the OWASP universe yet. And somebody please correct me if I'm wrong, because as you saw, there's a million moving parts here, and it was very, it'd be very easy for me to have missed it, but I haven't seen Bug Bounty, really, and the P-Cert side, so I think there's, there's definitely, to fill this out, this plan that I have, I think there are some pieces that could be added to it, and those are, those are two great examples. Yeah, hopefully this is a call to action. Start new projects. I think, what I, I think one of the things I'm going to do is, I think I'm going to take this and put it into a project. I thought, you know what, I've gone through and done all the work already. I might as well create a project and just dump all this into it, and then maybe update it in a year or two. Um, but that way, at least it, would, it could perhaps take on a life of its own, and other people might be able to add to it as we go as well. So that's my plan coming out of this. All right, any more questions? Yeah. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> oh, no word dot. Yo, that's true. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm a keep it simple person, too, so keep it simple. All right, that was, that was somebody's got to have a hard question because I'm an expert at deflecting hard questions back to someone else in the audience. It's a gift I have. <laughs> Give it back. Like, hey, what do you think about that? You got the, thank you. So, so, so it, like the guy said at the front, it was really great to see all of those things in, in, in that format, because actually going to the OWASP website is a complete nightmare um, trying to find stuff. So it, it, taking that, it, it, are there any plans, do you know, or is someone going to be working on the website to make it easier to find this stuff, to identify, it, even if you're struggling to find um, the, the Dojo application, yeah. you know, yeah. what, what hope for us? Yeah, I think um, I've heard various efforts are underway to revamp the wiki and make it better and make it harder to find. I think it's just a hard, I think it's a hard problem to solve. When you think about the number of resources that OWASP has you know, on the employee side as far as what they're doing. Uh, so I'm not, I'm not aware of any specific things, but yeah, I agree with you. After, you know, I mean, I, I went to the, the project inventory and I started at the top and I went through and clicked on everything and read and some projects I could tell were dead, and I just let them, you know, I, I ignored them because I could tell they were dead. But yeah, there's, this is a hard problem in that we have so many projects out there in this, and we, we gotta find a better way to index them. But hopefully we'll get something in the next year or two based on um, what I've heard from different forums and stuff, so. Yes, Matt. You said you would start uh, processes with threat modeling. Yeah. So I wonder how would you scale that? Uh, how much would you let the developers and architects do themselves, or where would you include security experts? Yeah. So the uh, that, that's a that is a great question about uh, scaling threat modeling. So if you're able to get some security community folks, some some champions. I think that's always the best way to go. If you're in an environment where you just don't have those people yet, they're just not there. Um, what I've done in the past is I just, started a, I just started going and meeting with various developers and threat modeling with them. The thing about threat modeling is I can sit up here and give a four hour lecture on it and after about five, 10 minutes, you've already checked out of that. With threat modeling, we gotta jump in and go, we, we just gotta start doing it and that's really the key. So if you're starting small and you don't have a big group, I would say if you understand threat modeling, you just go meet with a couple developers, a couple architects, go to the whiteboard, start drawing, teach them, and then hopefully they will begin to teach other people as you go. I think that's the model when you don't have a lot of money to, to be able to roll out a, a formal kind of a threat modeling approach. 
Thank you. All right, last call. Anyone else? Any other questions? Yes, you identified a gap uh, uh, for the for an OWASP offering for a secure software development uh, lifecycle. Yeah. Yesterday morning, uh, we had a nice talk uh, from a gentleman who has uh, h held a presentation on that, and I don't know if he was uh, ready to like make that an official OWASP project, but he's apparently working on a on a more uh, on a book or a paper about that. And maybe it would be uh, interesting to see if he could contribute uh, in that. Uh, yeah, direction. definitely. I'll I'll try and track it down. I'll look and see. I'll look at the and, <laughs> and right. see if I can find them. Yeah, I think that'd be great. I'd love to see a secure development lifecycle, high level, kind of an agile spin, a DevOps exactly. spin. Exactly. He he, he uh, touched upon uh, exactly all those uh, different uh, methodologies. Yeah, but we won't create a waterfall one. No. Oh no. <laughs> Oh, no. No, we, we don't want anybody to think that's okay to continue in that direction. So I, I, okay, I think sorry. there was one more question over here, and then I'm going to say that I'm going to go. Uh, it's a bit more to the back uh, from uh, the threat modeling. When you say you sit with the developers, is it also something you would do with customers directly? Uh, I've, never done, so I've never done threat modeling with customers directly. Okay. That would probably be a pretty interesting. If you had customers who were willing to sit there and actually go through and, and consider it, that'd be an interesting... I would if somebody would do it. That'd be an interesting conversation. So um, thanks, everybody, for your time. I'll be around for the next couple hours out here. So thank you.